Okay, so I just need to go off and make a change to this event. And, you know, we don't actually need this order value property, actually. This could just be a decimal field. Great, it's as simple as that. Let's just commit that change. We will commit that now and fantastic. Ship it, let's do it. <sighs> Event-driven systems, they're so easy to evolve. They're so good for making changes to a system independently. Right, let's see what the problem is here. Ah, ah, 210 errors, 186 errors. Oh, somebody's made a breaking change again. Damn event-driven systems. Why are they so hard to work with? I'm sure if any of you have worked on event-driven systems, or frankly, any software systems, you've had a similar problem to this. A system you didn't even know existed makes a breaking change, and before you know it, your system is offline. Distributed systems are actually defined by Leslie Lamport as one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. And whilst that's kind of a fun definition, it's not very useful for you as a developer, is it? Hi, I'm James Eastham, and in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about the things you should always do in your application code to not necessarily fully prevent these errors, but at least write your application code in a way that separates the external from the internal. And how you can do that using the idea of an anti-corruption layer. One of the most important things to remember is that the events you publish in an event-driven system are the API of your system. So you should treat those events with the same care. But in much the same way, if you were building or consuming an API, you wouldn't want to let any internal implementation details leak into other parts of the system. So when you are consuming an event from another system, an event that is that other system's API, you want to separate the data structure that the external system controls from the data structures in your internal system that are driving your internal business logic. And, and anti-corruption layers are a layer of application code at the boundary of your system. Think of them as part translator, part bouncer or doorman. Their job is to protect your system from any malformed or unknown messages and only let data through to your actual business logic that can actually be processed. As a message comes in, it's going to hit your anti-corruption layer first and the anti-corruption layer is going to check the contents and then try to translate that into a data structure that your internal system understands. That means the logic of your system is using data structures it owns and it controls. If a message is received that doesn't meet the criteria, that can be shipped off to a dead letter queue, put somewhere else for processing later. That means your actual application is only receiving messages that it can actually process. How exactly would you build an anti-corruption layer? Well, let's head up to the desk and find out. So the easiest way to implement an anti-corruption layer is to simply do it in memory inside your application code. So inside the order service in plant-based pizza, there's a handler that handles the payment success event. And you'll notice this handler for the payment success event uses this payment success object. This payment success object is a record, is an object that is defined by the order service. So the order service controls this data structure, the order service contains any changes. So, so all of the business logic that drives when a payment is successful is using data structures that are managed by the payment service. Now, when you actually look at when that event is received, so inside the plantbasedpizza.orders.worker, you've got all of your event handlers. These are the Dapper mappings for dealing with publish subscribe inside Dapper. This could equally be a piece of code that's reading messages from an SQS queue, that's receiving events from an SNS topic. It doesn't actually matter how you're receiving the event. Just notice that you've got a distinction between the code that's handling the event from the external system and the code that's driving your business logic. And you'll notice that the handle payment success event handler inside your actual worker, this is the thing that's handling the event from Dapper, uses this payment successful event V1. This is an external event. This is a representation inside the order service of the structure of a payment successful event. 
And when that payment successful event is received to your order service, you're doing checks to make sure that this event hasn't been received before. You're starting some spans, so you've got information in your telemetry on how long it takes to process a message. You're checking for item potency, all of that kind of infrastructure level stuff. And then you've got your actual payment success event handler. Here, rather than handling that payment successful event V1 directly, you're handling a new instance of your payment success object. And you're passing in the order identifier and the amount that comes from that payment successful event. So you're translating that external event into an internal data structure that you control. The other really useful thing you can do here though, inside the constructor for your payment success object, you're actually validating that this is an object that can be processed by the order service. You're checking that the order identifier exists and that the amount is greater or equal to zero. If the event that gets received doesn't have an order identifier or is for an invalid amount, then you're going to throw an argument exception. You can catch that in your actual infrastructure layer and return an internal server error, which, which will tell Dapper this event couldn't be processed and shift this message off to the dead letter queue. Now, all of this is happening here in memory inside the payment successful event handler. You're receiving the event from Dapper and you're translating that external event structure into an internal event structure that you control. So if that breaking change was to be made, whilst this handler would still run, all that would happen is that argument exception would be thrown, you'd return an internal server error, that would then ship this message off to a dead letter key. Now there's an alternate approach to doing this. Here you're doing everything in memory. So any problematic messages are going to affect the load that your main service is under. You could, of course, run your anti-corruption layer as a completely independent service. And that is what the kitchen service inside plant-based pizza decided to do. Of course, this further increases complexity in your system because you've got an independent moving part, an independent microservice that you need to manage. So it's not ideal from a complexity perspective, but it offers you the most protection for your actual application service. And a kind of side benefit to that, if you need to update the event structures in your system, you know that you've got a single place to look. All of the external events that the kitchen service consumes pass through this anti-corruption layer. All this service is doing is receiving events from the public event bus that are being published publicly, translating them into an internal data structure and publishing them on an internal message channel. So if you have so if you have a look at this plantbasedpizza.kitchen.acl project and look at your event handler, remember the event handler is what is actually receiving the event using Dapper. So this will look very, very similar to the one you saw in the in-memory anti-corruption layer. You're still extracting data from the HTTP context. You're still starting a span for your telemetry. You're still checking item potency. But here you're just making a call to this adapter.translate method. This adapter.translate is a method on this event adapter object. And you'll notice all that is happening here is that we're logging that the event has been received, and then we're republishing an event using the Dapper client. So all this handler is doing is receiving the event and republishing it. However, it is republishing it to a different topic. It is using a name of internal.kitchen.orderConfirmed, and it's creating a new instance of this order confirmed class. And much like when you were doing this in memory, you can still validate that the event you've received, the external event that has come into your system, meets the criteria that you need, namely that the order identifier actually exists. If the order identifier field doesn't exist or it's null or empty, you're going to throw that argument exception again, which is going to bubble back up, return an error to Dapper. Dapper is going to shift this message off to your dead letter queue. Running this as an independent process, of course, really protects your actual business logic, your actual system, because any malformed events, any events that can't be processed are going to be received by this anti-corruption layer, translated and passed on if they're okay, shifted off to a dead letter queue if they're not okay. At this point, you might be sat there thinking, well, both of those approaches are overkill. And yes, Either way, you add an anti-corruption layer is going to add an extra layer of complexity, particularly if you're doing that by adding an additional microservice that's only doing the work of the anti-corruption layer. The trade-off, however, is that you aren't using a data structure that's controlled by an external system inside your system's internal business logic. You should always, always have some form of translation between an external event that's controlled by somebody else and something that drives your internal business logic. 
Now, for the most part, you're going to be absolutely fine doing that in memory. Have a layer between the thing that actually receives the event and your internal system. That adds that extra layer of resilience by translating that data structure and other system controls into a data structure that you control. Now, of course, you can do that as well using a completely separate running process, which does further protect your internal system from errors. It removes events that can't be processed right at the boundary of your system. But of course, that does have the trade-off of you needing to manage and run one additional application. Always, always remember, the events in an event-driven system are the API of the system that publishes them. Wherever possible, protect your system from directly consuming those events. Only run business logic from an event structure you own, whether you're using containers or functions as a service, separate internal events from external events. And whilst that doesn't stop you getting into a mess like your two colleagues at the start of this video, it does at least prevent it taking your entire system offline.